Hi, my name is Emily Blevins and I'm a conservation biologist here at Xerces and today I'm going to talk to you about western freshwater mussel conservation. First I'd like to introduce you to freshwater mussels. Mussels are a group of species that belong to a, a large group called mollusks. Uh, mollusks include a huge diversity of different types of animals ranging from squid to clams to snails and slugs. Freshwater mussels are just one kind of um, species that are found in this group and mussels are um, found in a variety of habitats uh, in freshwater, whereas the larger group of mollusks are found in marine, terrestrial, estuarine, and freshwater habitats. So mollusks are found over um, a large portion of the earth and come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. Um, freshwater mussels are special because they are found in our freshwater environments, which include um, rivers, lakes, uh, streams, creeks, um, and they're, uh, they belong to a group known as bivalves, which include some of the commercially important species like clams, uh, marine mussels, and oysters. So a lot of the species that we actually like to eat are bivalves. And the bivalve actually refers to the two portions of a shell. So a freshwater mussel um, is actually the animal and the shell. So this is just an example um, of a bivalve. So freshwater mussels themselves are also fairly diverse. There are um, more than 900 species of mussels that are found distributed across the world. And North America is actually a hotspot of biodiversity for mussels. So North America has um, around 300 different species of freshwater mussels, with um, the vast majority of those found in the eastern US, um, particularly in the southeast, where you can find as many as 100 or more different species in a single river system, 30 of which maybe would be um, endemic or unique to just that river system. Unfortunately, freshwater mussels are also among the most imperiled organisms um, in North America. Together with freshwater snails, these animals face really high extinction risk, including um, the extinction of uh, more than 30 species of mussels uh, in North America alone already. Um, so we're, we're losing these species at a significant rate um, and they are highly imperiled. Mussels are unique among um, other mollusks in that they have a very complex life cycle that incorporates the use of, of a host fish. Uh, so to reproduce, mussels are actually reliant on freshwater fish to help them um, uh, disperse and metamorphose their young. So a mussel life cycle begins with the adults, um, which uh, fertilize eggs that the female mussel will hold um, and then release to the environment in the form of a larval stage known as a glochidium. And many of these glochidia are actually released uh, in the vicinity of a, a fish that serves as a host. So these mussels will attach to the head, the fins, um, and the gills of their host where they uh, are a temporary parasite lasting on the fish for maybe one and a half weeks to up to a month or so, um, depending on water temperature. Although they are a parasite of uh, fish, they don't cause much harm to the host in a natural environment, and this is a huge benefit to freshwater mussels because mussels are um, typically very sessile animals in that uh, where they land as a, a juvenile um, and grow into an adult is where they're gonna spend the vast majority of their life. So um, a fish provides an opportunity for a mussel to actually move among water bodies or throughout a river system, which is incredibly beneficial for um, rescuing of populations or establishment of new populations. Um, and so fish are, are vital to mussels. Of course, as I'll explain a little bit later, mussels are also very important for fish. Um, so this really is a symbiotic relationship. Mussels spend just a short amount of time in this larval stage on a fish and then um, will drop off as a juvenile mussel that's prepared to um, feed and grow into an its adult form. Um, again, this is unique uh, for freshwater mussels. Other species of um, bivalves actually don't have this type of relationship with fish. Um, mussels are also very long-lived and um, highly productive under the right conditions. So freshwater mussels um, can live to ages of more than 100 years um, and compare that with other aquatic macroinvertebrates that may last a single season or only a few seasons as an adult um, in rivers and lakes. Mussels have this incredible capacity to produce over a long period of time, um, meaning that they can have a very large impact on their environment. 
So just to tell you a little bit about um, mussels and how they live, this is what I think is really interesting about mussels. Um, so they are aquatic and they do rely on freshwater habitats. So you'll find them um, only in locations where water is permanent year round um, and supports fish because of that host fish relationship. Uh, unlike zebra mussels, which are able to attach themselves to infrastructure, which is part of the reason they cause so much economic damage, our native mussels are actually um, anchored into the bottoms of our rivers and lakes through um, a, a pseudo foot that they actually burrow into um, the bottom substrate. And so this uh, burrowing lifestyle has a lot of advantages for mussels in that they can move short distances and they, um, they are able to um, feed themselves with the use of their foot, um, but they, uh, they also still spend much of their life in the same location where they drop um, as a juvenile. And you can find this in natural habitats. Sometimes you'll find a, a living mussel whose shell has actually um, adapted to the shape of a rock or root that um, they grew up against over the course of their lives. And again, this is over decades um, that a mussel will grow and live in a particular area. Um, mussels are characterized by filtering, which is how they um, breathe, how they feed, how they reproduce. And so um, there are some really interesting ways that uh, by filtering water, they're actually um, changing the environment around them for the better. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the things that uh, mussels do is by filtering, they are feeding from the water column, and so they're gathering um, algae and bacteria uh, in the water. And, um, and that's really their main source of food. Uh, and, and where um, rivers are, are productive, mussels can reach very high abundance with as many as um, 10,000 to 100,000 mussels in what's called a mussel bed. Um, and, uh, and those mussel beds can persist for hundreds of years under the right conditions. Um, so where mussels occur, they can really, again, have a, have a unique impact on their environment. Um, the photo that I show here is actually of one of our native western mussels. Uh, in the image you can see with the mussels in my hand, this, these are animals that were all collected from a very, very small hole that I dug um, in the bottom of a a very productive stream. These are western pearl shell mussels and you can see that this is a very healthy population that has um, very young individuals at the tip of my finger all the way up to adults who are decades old. Um, and then the, in the image next to that you can also see uh, what a mussel bed looks like underwater if you were to take a peek. Um, I do have a note here, just a star next to the word abundant, because uh, unfortunately in habitats where um, it's less productive or in habitats that have been negatively impacted um, by either poor water quality or habitat destruction, um, mussels can also occur you know, singly or in very, very small numbers. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this with the discussion of conservation. So again, mussels are found in permanent um, or semi-permanent water bodies. Um, so this could include uh, large lakes or even small floodplain ponds. Um, also headwater streams. Uh, mussels occur from sea level all the way up to you know, high meadows in the Sierras. As long as there are host fish and there is habitat and water is present year round, there's a good chance that mussels could occur there. Um, it's surprising uh, some of the places you can actually find them. For example, in the image under perennial water bodies, you might not expect to find mussels in a, what looks like a puddle, but this is actually a stream that um, dries out in portions, and in those places where water persists, that's where we find mussel beds. And in fact, in the small puddle you see there, there are more than 300 western pearl shell. So it's pretty impressive where they can survive. Um, there are some specific things that mussels need uh, in their habitat to really thrive. Um, among those are things like stable features, and this could include uh, large cobble or boulders or bedrock, um, but the stability that is found in portions of rivers naturally um, enables mussels to persist during things like seasonal high flows, um, particularly after large rainstorms or snowmelt. Um, these stable features are very important for mussels to avoid being swept downstream because, again, they're, they're burrowed into the um, bottom of rivers and streams and that's really how they're able to persist. Um, 
diverse structure, such as uh, root networks that are found uh, in the vicinity of really healthy riparian ecosystems are also really important for freshwater mussels. And um, you may be able to see just at the very bottom of that um, image is a, a mussel tucked in among the roots. So these are areas that really support mussels um, and, uh, and the fish that are also important to mussels because they provide structure. These are food resources. Um, so again, healthy aquatic ecosystems are really good for mussels. Um, burrowing material is an important component of um, mussel habitat. Uh, for mussels to really be able to um, uh, anchor themselves and um, effectively you know, position themselves for the long term, they need materials such as um, fine sediment, sand, um, gravels. Uh, these are all common types of substrate that mussels burrow into. And having an abundance of this type of material is really beneficial for mussels because then they're able to um, land in new habitat uh, when dropping off of a host fish, more likely to, to find a suitable location to grow and thrive. Um, as well as persist when, for example, uh, high flows do shift sediment around because our, our rivers are constantly changing. Um, and so having habitat that uh, is widespread um, is really important for mussels. And then again, um, permanent water. Um, our water bodies naturally dry during portions of the year, so lakes can get a little smaller um, during higher temperatures and um, during the summer months. Um, mussels need to be able to find good habitat when uh, drying occurs, and so having um, abundant water is also really important for them. So I've talked about what's important to freshwater mussels, but mussels are also incredibly important for the entire freshwater ecosystem because of the benefits that they provide. So by filtering, mussels are able to um, capture nutrients that might otherwise flow downstream um, and down to the ocean. But mussels, by filtering, they're drawing in those nutrients, they're using them, they're repackaging some of them in what are called pseudo feces, and then they're depositing those in their environment. Um, and when they do that, they're actually providing food for um, other organisms. So grazers like snails um, are found often in high abundance in the vicinity of freshwater mussels. It's also fairly common to find um, abundant fish populations where mussels occur because, again, mussels and fish are using similar habitat because of their um, relationship with each other. We get um, clearer water where mussels occur, so mussels can reduce the turbidity of streams. Um, which is important for the growth of primary producers and, again, creating more fish food. Uh, and we have some really neat research that shows that mussels are cleaning our water of contaminants, including um, E. coli, for example, which is a disease um, that affects humans. So mussels are, are performing this ecosystem service, um, multiple ecosystem services that are important um, for both us and for um, the aquatic uh, animals and other organisms that they're uh, supporting. Right, so now I'm going to switch to talk to you about uh, western species of freshwater mussels. And just to explain this a little bit, uh, our work at Xerces has mainly focused on western species of freshwater mussels. Um, I did mention that the largest diversity of mussels is found in the eastern U.S. Um, where many species are uh, either extinct, endangered, threatened, or otherwise face some level of imperilment. Um, in the western U.S., uh, typically far less has been uh, known about our western species, including their conservation status. And so this has become a priority for Xerces to contribute to the body of knowledge about western freshwater mussels. Um, it's worth saying that although we don't have the incredible diversity found in the eastern U.S., the mussels in western North America do constitute a fairly unique fauna. Um, when I say Western North America, in fact, I am talking about um, west of the Continental Divide. Um, and the species that we have here belong to three different groups of um, freshwater mussels, which I'll explain in just a minute. But our Western species are found um, here in Western North America, and uh, including the US, Canada, and Northern Mexico, um, as well as in portions of Russia. And one of our species is um, actually located in Alaska um, and over into um, far eastern Russia. Uh, but in the maps that I'm showing here, you'll see uh, the locations of freshwater mussels found here 
just in North America. Um, those are the open circles depicted on the maps. Um, so you can see that mussels occur from, uh, again, northern Mexico up through western states, including Utah, Nevada, um, portions of um, Wyoming and Montana that are west of the Continental Divide, and then on to the coast. Um, our mussel fauna here in the western U.S. includes the western pearl shell, which is our most long-lived species of freshwater mussel in the western North America. Um, this is a species that can live as long as 100 years or more, um, and it uh, relies specifically on salmonids for uh, completion of metamorphosis. So their host fish is restricted to species of salmon and trout, um, which is not uh, particularly typical among um, western species. Uh, it does have the widest distribution in uh, western North America of our um, western mussels, ranging from portions of uh, central California all the way up to Alaska. Um, and this is also a species that occurs in very high abundance when, um, when in ideal habitat. So um, uh, where uh, there's sufficient food and, and good habitat and good host fish populations, um, these mussel beds can reach uh, many tens of thousands in a single location. The western ridge mussel uh, is another interesting uh, species of western freshwater mussel because it is the only uh, living member of its genus, so it's fairly unique among mussels in the world. Um, this is a species that also lives many years, uh, 30 to 60 or more years potentially, um, and it relies on a wider variety of host fish than uh, our western pearl shell does. So this species uses um, fish such as dace and sculpin uh, to complete its reproduction. Um, it is found in fewer states uh, and provinces in western North America. Um, it, it doesn't occur in the extreme southwestern portion of the west, um, nor does it occur in the extreme northern portion. Um, and this is also uh, our most imperiled western species, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then when we get to the group of floaters, this is our uh, confusing species complex. Um, so floaters have uh, very few morphological or um, shell features that help you to distinguish which species you actually are looking at. So among our western mussels, it is possible to identify um, western ridge mussel and western pearl shell just from looking at the shell. Um, among our floaters, this is not the case. They all look fairly similar and they all have um, incredible um, what we call plasticity, meaning that uh, they can be highly variable in shape and size um, as well as color. So our floaters are confusing um, and there is research being done now to look at genetic differences among the species of floaters to help um, determine how many species we have. Um, in general, however, floaters share uh, quite a bit in common, including a, a wide diversity of host fish. So our floater mussels can use um, both native and non-native fish to reproduce, and they can use salmon, they can use sculpin and dace like uh, the western ridge mussel, and then they can use a wide variety of other species as well. Um, they have the widest distribution as a group, again, from Russia to Alaska to um, northern Mexico, but the exact distribution of individual species differs. Um, okay, so that's the introduction to our western species of mussels. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the work that Xerces is doing to promote mussel conservation in the west. So I've mentioned several times how imperiled mussels are. Um, this is a result of multiple factors, including historic, recurring, and um, some potential future impacts that are, are, we're already seeing the effects of. Among these are things like um, historic overharvest of mussels, because mussels were um, used in the late 1800s and early to mid 1900s for things such as um, the button industry, which resulted in harvest of, of many, many mussels um, over the decades. Uh, mussels were also uh, used in the pearl culturing industry, which has uh, declined in recent years, but um, at one point resulted in the uh, overharvest of mussels in many um, rivers. 
Habitat destruction was also a, a major issue historically um, where humans developed waterways um, for hydropower, for transportation, um, and, and for other uses. Um, this resulted in initial early declines of many of our um, mussel species, particularly in the eastern U.S. where um, species of mussels actually went extinct as a result of um, these activities. More recently, mussels have faced a series of chronic threats that range from things such as continued habitat alteration, um, so where we dredge, where we channelize and straighten rivers, where we develop uh, shorefront properties, um, and where we um, otherwise impact our waterways. Um, these, these have affected and continue to affect our um, freshwater mussels. Other things such as water management play a very important role in the persistence of freshwater mussels. Um, things that impact the amount of water that's available, so in places where we dry streams or we um, overuse water, um, create hotter conditions and um, lower flow, these can have really negative effects on mussel populations. Um, other things such as pollution, uh, Although mussels are able to filter a variety of contaminants out of our waterways to our benefit, they, they also suffer from um, the effects of pollution in our water. Um, invasive species, again, are uh, a concern and have been in the eastern U.S. where the introduction of zebra mussels had a very strong negative impact on um, freshwater mussel populations. And of course, um, all of these are things that um, improve in some ways and um, you know require continued um, efforts on our part to improve conditions. Um, there are also recent and emerging issues that uh, we're facing with freshwater mussel uh, conservation and this includes things like unexplained die-offs which are now being reported in different parts of the country including in the western U.S. Um, these are instances where entire mussel beds are lost for um, an unknown reason. Uh, things like lack of reproduction are also a concern in, in some populations, including in the West. Um, for example, there are populations where we can find a, you know, a large mussel bed that has many adult mussels um, that have persisted for decades but haven't actually reproduced over the course of those decades. And so to ensure that we have mussels into the future, we need to understand what's causing this and how to, um, how to mitigate it. And then, of course, we have the uh, impending issues of climate change, which have the potential to really impact mussel populations across the U.S., um, in part because of the impacts uh, to host fish and to the interaction between mussels and their host fish, uh, which is critical to reproduction, as well as drying habitat, uh, changes in distribution, um, and impacts to water quality because water temperature is such an important part of water quality. So there are many reasons why mussels um, have faced impairment over the years. Um, in the western U.S., this has been a, a major focus of our work here at Xerces and is understanding um, the extent to which western mussels are imperiled. Um, so one of the projects that we completed um, in the last several years with our partners, um, including the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, um, here in Oregon, as well as some other collaborators, um, such as the Pacific Northwest Native Freshwater Mussel Work Group, um, is to assemble all of the information we have on the locations of, of freshwater mussels throughout history, ranging from the first date that um, a mussel was recognized and named um, up to today when people are collecting uh, information on the distribution of um, many different species in our river systems. Um, we've compiled all of this information into the Western Freshwater Mussel Database, which is an important component of our conservation work. Um, and we've used methods established by the IUCN Red List to assess how mussels have fared when looking at their historic distribution compared to their more recent distribution. And our analysis of this work found that um, our Western mussels are declining, which um, there was evidence to support this previously, but now we have um, a larger body of information that has indicated that species like the western ridge mussel have declined from more than 40% of their historic range. Um, other species, such as one of our floater species, has disappeared from large portions of the range, particularly in Southern California and Arizona. Um, and even species that can be very abundant in certain places, such as the western pearl shell, are disappearing um, in some areas as a result of um, lack of reproduction, um, impacts to existing mussel beds, and then um, 
unexplained die-offs. So um, we do recognize that muscle Muscles in the western U.S. are declining, um, much like their eastern counterparts. And so as a result, we focused our efforts on um, finding ways to conserve the remaining populations that we have and, and support um, their persistence into the future. Um, we do this through a variety of methods, which include components of education and outreach. Um, we also uh, work with professionals who manage land and water. Um, who develop policy and who um, are involved in um, natural resource issues to ensure that mussels are included um, because they're fairly easy to overlook, particularly because they're um, often unobtrusive and can be challenging to um, uh, even find mussel beds um, even when they're there. So we, we advocate for mussels to ensure that people keep them in mind, um, including working with professionals to conduct surveys um, and document locations that make it into our Western Freshwater Mussel Database. We also work with uh, restoration professionals to help them incorporate mussels into their work and ensure that mussel beds will persist into the future at their sites. We provide workshops and share information on mussels with professionals to um, teach them about many of the things that you've just learned about with uh, freshwater mussel biology and distribution. Um, and, uh, and we do this kind of in a holistic fashion to ensure that we're reaching members of the public, people who work in natural resources, and then the biologists who um, manage uh, these species. In addition to um, on the ground and outreach work, we also have compiled this information um, to share it with people uh, in other formats. So we have written blog posts, we have um, written essays and articles about the impacts of climate change or um, the decline in western freshwater mussels. Um, we've compiled a best management practices document that uh, explains how to protect mussels when you're working in habitats where they're found. And then we've also compiled this mussel database with our partners. Um, and all of this is intended to really increase support because mussels are providing some incredible services, not just to us, but to the aquatic environment that um, is so important in to the future, particularly if you're someone who drinks water or um, you know sees the benefit of salmon and other native fish, mussels are so fundamental to um, healthy functioning aquatic ecosystems, um, and that's an easy story to tell. So, um, mussel conservation can also include. Um, citizen scientists and members of the public. This is not something that's just restricted to um, people who are doing official research or who um, manage water and land. Um, one of the most uh, simple things that an individual can do to support mussel conservation is really to join the fight against um, invasive aquatic species like zebra mussels. So when we see things like um, aquatic invasive species permits for your boat, um, ensuring that you're not the person introducing um, invasive species into waterways is critical for um, conservation of not just mussels but um, all of our western um, aquatic species. Um, learning more about our native species is, is always an important way to um, to support conservation because without understanding how mussels are fundamental to our um, aquatic ecosystems, it's harder to understand why conservation is so important. Um, so I encourage you to learn more about our mussels. Um, you can find more information at our website and in some of our publications on mussels. Um, we also ask that if you are seeing shells or observing mussels um, when you're out enjoying uh, your local river or lake, uh, to share that information with us because we do use that to support all of our efforts um, with outreach and, and research. Um, we do ask that you don't handle mussels if you see them. Um, just take pictures uh, or examine shells because uh, often a permit is required to do more with mussels to handle them. Um, and we also want to make sure that uh, populations are not harmed by um, just documenting where they are. 
Um, and then we also encourage you to speak up for muscles because um, they are e easily overlooked. Uh, and so if there are proposals for um, restoration work or for um, any kind of construction or uh, other activities in your local waterways, um, mussels are an important part of, of those ecosystems. And so by um, advocating for them and um, even just asking the question, has anyone considered mussels? Do we know if they're here? That can really provide um, an important voice that um, to this point, I think, has not been heard. Okay, so thank you for your interest in freshwater mussels, and for more information, please do visit our website.